Hello, everybody. I apologize for the technical glitches on the live version of this talk, and I hope this uh, recorded version uh, is a little more informative. So I'm going to be talking about Sector 25 at the APS, where we're building two new beam lines that are designed for spectroscopy. The main topics in my talk are going to be a short introduction to the APS upgrade, then I'll discuss some of the current and future programs that were going on at 20ID and elsewhere. These will be uh, moving to 25ID, and I'll describe how they inform some of our design decisions. Then I'll describe the overall beamline design and uh, end with looking at some interesting details about the beamline designs. So before I get into the meat of the talk, let me acknowledge some of the people that worked on this project. There's quite a few additional people, but I, I wanted to at least acknowledge some of the more primary uh, contributors. So on the engineering side, Jonathan Knopp has done the most work of anybody on this slide. He's been the primary engineer for the beamline. Dale Brew is working on the controls. In project management, Bob Winarski is the overall project manager and has been working closely on the Hutch construction. Tim Graber is the uh, manager who's been working on the procurement of the optics, the monochromators and mirrors, and he's doing this for all of the upgrade beam lines. In the early days of our design, Shambo Shi did a lot of simulations looking at uh, how, how our optics uh, would perform and helping us to find specifications. And Alina and Ray have been making our optical components, the, the crystals and multilayers. So let me start by describing the APS upgrade. Um, I think a lot of you have probably seen this slide or versions of it. Uh, basically, the APS plans to completely replace the current uh, storage ring with the so-called multiband acromat lattice storage ring. And the main feature of this is illustrated in the uh, in the pictures here showing the beam, the source uh, point of the beam. Today we have a very large horizontal source size, whereas with the upgrade, the horizontal and vertical source size will be roughly the same. And to quantify this, we use the emittance of the source. This is the horizontal emittance. Actually, the current design calls for a horizontal emittance about 42 picometers. And for comparison, the current ring uh, has a horizontal emittance of about 3,000. So it's a dramatic improvement in the emittance. Um, there was a question about uh, the swap out injection. I'm not an expert on the accelerator, but I guess with the new accelerator uh, design that regular top-off injection won't, won't be feasible. So the plan is to completely remove a bunch and then replace it with a, a new bunch when they're doing what would be the equivalent for top-off. Uh, top um, the main limitation of that is that the maximum current in a bunch then is going to be the maximum current that the injector system can put out. So right now, the injector can't really put out enough to support uh, what will be nominally the 48 bunch mode operating at 200 milliamps or about, or about uh, five, four or five milliamps per bunch. So it does mean that the uh, injector system needs to be upgraded somewhat to reach the final performance. So the upgrade plans to build eight, what they call eight new feature beam lines. These are beam lines that are, are basically either completely new or very major upgrades of existing beam lines. But in addition, there's going to be about 30 beam line enhancement projects. These, are, these range from small projects, maybe just replacing a mirror, or in some cases, even a more 
significant enhancement to the beam line by, say, getting a new uh, undulator or something. Um, all of these are described in detail in this document um, that's available on the APS website, the final design review report, um, which probably gives more than you want to hear, both about the accelerator and uh, all these uh, beamline projects. So one of the one of the uh, parts of the enhancement is to build two long beam lines, the ISM and Hexam beam lines. Um, it turns out that the best position in terms of least disruption to infrastructure and wetlands and so forth is at sectors 19 and 20. So this means since we're at 20 ID, we need to move our, our um, programs. And fortunately, there's an empty, well, actually the last empty sector 25. And so at sector 25, we plan to build a canted undulator beam line, both to take the current 20 ID programs and to add some of the time resolved spectroscopy uh, efforts at 11 ID and 7 ID. This just shows another uh, view of these long beam lines. So as I mentioned, 20 ID is moving to the empty sector 25. We'll expand to two beam lines using a candid undulator and provide a home for the time resolve spectroscopy programs. One of the reasons for moving the time resolve pump pro programs is that it's uh, expected that there may be less timing mode operation in after the upgrade because the timing mode does degrade the uh, performance of the ring a little bit. And so there probably will be pressure from other beam lines, non-timing beam lines, to, to minimize the amount of timing. And moving some of these programs to other sectors allows them to run simultaneously when the timing mode is, is operational, along with the, the, scattering pro, the scattering pump pro programs that were at these sectors. Now, also, because they want to get started on these long beam lines, they have to build a whole new building and everything. Uh, the idea is to move our beam line prior to the uh, main upgrade shutdown. So in fact, we hope to start moving our equipment over sometimes early next year. And then just to close the uh, description of the upgrade, this shows the performance of the undulators that we plan for both of our branch beam lines. Um, as you see, the flux is only improved by roughly a factor of two coming from the 200 milliamps in the new ring. Um, although I should note that this calculation for the upgrade is a one by one millimeter um, aperture whereas currently we use a two by one millimeter aperture to get this performance. And what that means is that uh, the total power on our optics is reduced since the, the power tends to just go as the area. And then of course, as mentioned, the brilliance is, a, is gonna have a dramatic improvement, roughly an order of mag two orders of magnitude. And the brilliance will immediately improve things like the micro focusing. So now I'd like to talk about our programs currently at 20 ID and how they affect our design uh, for the new beam lines. So we have an X-ray microprobe, which uses the usual thing of fluorescence mapping and microspectroscopy. It also has uh, these uh, microchannel optics for confocal imaging with about a two micron depth resolution in the sample. We have what we call the advanced spectroscopy stations where we do various types of high resolution fluorescence spectroscopy using either bent analyzers or MINIX crystals. So either emission spectroscopy or uh, HERFTI type experiments. They also at these uh, stations do just sort of regular XFs, but things that need a very high brightness beam, for example, very dilute samples or thin films where we're working in glancing angles. We have a Lyric spectrometer 
where we do X-ray Raman, which was discussed earlier in this series of talks uh, by Simu. Um, and another program that we've just started is uh, the single event effects in semiconductors, uh, which is being uh, operated under Aerospace Corporation partner user proposal. I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a later slide. Uh, to be added at Sector 25, as I mentioned, is the time-resolved uh, spectroscopy. So one thing for, I don't know, a lot of users of 20ID also use 20BM, and I just wanted to note that 20BM is not moving in this process. So just a little bit more detail in the microprobe beamline science. Of course, most of you understand that it's, it's important in things like environmental and geoscience, uh, cleanup of DOE sites, energy science, so forth. Um, we want to combine this with uh, the MINIC style spectrometers where we can uh, potentially do chemically sensitive mapping using emission spectroscopy simultaneously to obtaining the uh, fluorescence maps. Um, so what we need for this type of, ex of experiments, of course, is a microprobe. And we're looking to operate in somewhere in the range of about 0.5 to 5, or maybe even up to 10 microns. And for enhancing the MINIX type uh, measurements, a wide band pass monochrometer to increase our signal levels. So, I'll, so let me go into a little bit more detail on this new capability I've been talking about, emission-based imaging. We know that X-ray emission spectroscopy can be sensitive to spin state, valent, ligands. Um, and the mini spectrometer can collect the whole spectrum simultaneously, so it can be combined with imaging. And I show an example of where this might be useful. This is a cobalt emission from a catalyst. Uh, these, these signals took about 30 seconds, but what it shows is there's a significant difference between the cobalt that's uh, in the calcine sample, which is uh, coordinated with oxygen and the sulfide sample where the coordination is sulfur, even though the valence in both cases is the same. So we could imagine doing a map of a catalyst sample where we look at the cobalt emission and we can make out a map of areas that are oxygen or areas that are sulfur coordinated. The problem with doing this right now is it takes of order 30 to 100 seconds to get a good emission spectrum. Uh, but with the MBA lattice, the microprobe uh, capabilities will be improved significantly by the brightness improvement. And also, we plan to have this multilayer monochromator, which will give a wide band pass and increase our flux by 20 to as many as, as much as 100 times uh, the flux. So now we can talk about sub-second um, emission spectra, and then we can collect a full uh, image with you know a significant number of pixels. We did a sort of a test experiment here, um, looking at a battery electrode, looking at the nickel emission, looking for chlorine and, and metal components. But you can see by the coarse grid on these uh, images that it, it wasn't really feasible to do a large area. And also, we're trying to improve this emissions spectrometers. We have a LDRD-funded proposal that is looking at both making uh, better emission spectrometers and also, as important or maybe more important, how we can analyze uh, an image of a spectra which maybe have, a, say, 10,000 or even 100,000 pixels. So we had access to a larger Pilatus detector. so. We could make a, a module with many more crystals, which would increase our signal. But probably more interesting is that by putting different crystals in, in different rows here, we can look at the emission of different elements at the same time. So in this example that I show, we were looking at chromium, iron, and the elastic line was actually set to be for the chromium, the sample didn't, or cobalt, the sample didn't have cobalt, but uh, it demonstrates that we could detect it. Um, and in fact, more recently, we've done some examples where we looked at battery electrodes where um, we simultaneously took the emission spectrum from cobalt, nickel, and manganese. So we think this is a potentially a nice enhancement to our microprobe capabilities, and it's one of the things we're going to be pushing at the new sector. 
So just to go a little bit more into Lyric's spectrometer, uh, it was the first instrument to do Q-dependent IXS, where it has uh, uh, analyzers at all, basically to covering the whole Q range. Um, it's been used quite a bit for X-ray Raman type experiments, looking at in situ samples where uh, low energy X-rays are, are difficult to apply. Um, and one of the things that we're pushing on is, uh, and has had a lot of interest in, is high pressure research using diamond anvil cells. I show one example here. Um, what we need for that is really improved focusing, and that's what's going to come sort of automatically from the MBA lattice. So the advanced spectroscopy stations, as I mentioned, we use do a lot of different uh, emission type spectroscopies, fluorescent spectroscopies. Um, we also plan to enhance our focusing. We have available KB mirrors up to about 300 millimeters long. We have several sets. And in fact, with our 300 millimeter long mirrors, we should be able to collect the entire uh, beam from the MBA lattice and focus to uh, a few microns. So the requirement here are, are again, high flux for some of these applications that don't need the micro beam and reasonably good focusing. Usually the spectrometers work best if the beam size is of order 100 microns or lower. And again, we think it'll be useful to have a wide bandpass monochromator for emission spectrometers. So this just shows some examples of HERFTI that we've taken. Uh, we've been finding that these shorter radii, half meter radii bent uh, Strip bent, strip bent analyzers are quite useful for HERFTI experiments because they get basically the same signal as four uh, more traditional one meter analyzers, but have a reasonably good energy resolution. Not quite as good maybe, but good enough for HERFTI as you can see here. So I'm not gonna talk a little bit, a lot about it, but just to mention again, we, we want the time resolved uh, spectroscopy science to move to our beam line. Um, they require a large tunable energy range. Um, they'd like a quite a large range of spot sizes, so we'll have available these KB mirrors, as I mentioned. And of course, they need separate laser hutches and laser interlock systems to support uh, safe operation of the lasers. So finally, to talk about uh, the single event effect pro program, it comes from the fact that in space, the, often the semiconductors have what they call single event effect uh, upsets or, or resets due to a heavy ion passing through the semiconductor and generating a large charge track as illustrated here. Uh, the problem is, is that in current, the current ion sources that they use, it's difficult to really focus the beam as well as they would like to be able to examine specific areas on the chip. And so what has been done is using lasers, which can be focused and, and can generate a significant amount of charge in the semiconductors. But the lasers uh, have a short penetration depth, and they also can't penetrate the metallization on the surface. So typically, in order to do these experiments, they have to uh, thin down the, the backside of the chip to uh, 20 or 30 microns or, or smaller, which of course is not ideal process in terms of looking at chips that changes their heat distribution and so forth. And uh, also the charge track that the uh, laser generates, it most of the charge will be uh, absorbed, generated near the surface. Whereas with X-rays, we can pick the right energy to penetrate the metallization. And also by picking the right energy and, and the amount of photons in the pulse, we can generate a charge track that's very similar to the charge track of a heavy ion. So this has become quite popular now for looking at chips, looking at uh, areas of the chips that are more and, and less sensitive to these heavy ions. And so we plan to continue to uh, support these experiments as well. So based on all these experiments that we plan to run, we come up with these overall design goals for our beamline. Uh, for the microprobe branch, 
we decided to try to cover the range of 4 to 32 keV, which covers all the elements basically heavier than potassium. Uh, we want a microprobe capability, as I mentioned, with a zoom capability. Uh, the multilayer monochromator option for non-resonant applications. And of course, we need to provide adequate separation from the other branch so that the experiments aren't too uh, constrained. The lyrics or advanced spectroscopy branch, we decided to try to cover a little bit higher energy range, up to 40 keV for a few applications such as the barium and lanthanum K edges. Uh, we want the possibility for better than silicon 111 resolution. Again, the multilayer monochromator will be useful, and we need space for multiple stations. So this gave us the basic optical layout shown, shown at the bottom. We have horizontal re, re deflecting mirrors to separate the two beams. Uh, on the Lyrics branch, it's a single bendable mirror operating at two milliradians. This gives us a 40 keV cutoff with platinum. Although we'll have three stripes, silicon, rhodium, and platinum for harmonic rejection. The mirror quality is good enough that we'll be able to focus the uh, entire beam down to horizontally down to 50 microns or, or so. For the micropro branch, we decided to have two mirrors operating at a slightly bigger angle to give more beam separation. First mirror will be a flat mirror. Second mirror, again, is bendable for horizontal focusing and uh, possible slope error correction. Again, three stripes for harmonic rejection. The monochromator is, has a small offset, as mentioned, so it allows the use of both either a single, either double crystal monochromator or operating as a double multilayer monochromator. Cover the energy range up to 40 keV and with the silicon 111. And the multilayers will cover the energy range of about 5 to 20 keV. Uh, on the Lyrics branch, we also would like to have a secondary monochromator, which could be a simple channel cut with either silicon 220 or silicon 311. Uh, it would have a small energy range for these secondary monochromators so that the beam offset can be made very small. So this just shows the overall layout. Again, I mentioned it's a completely new beam line being built on a green field space. So uh, we're able to take advantage of the whole sector. The mirrors are in this first optical enclosure. And we, made, we have enough collimation in this enclosure that uh, all the white beam and uh, Bremsstrahlen radiation can be stopped before they exit this uh, hutch so that in the Hutch with the optics, the monochromators, we don't need to rely on the a big beam offset on the monochromators to uh, provide adequate shielding. This just shows a little bit closer uh, view of the station itself, of the various stations. So as I mentioned, the monochromators up here, they're fairly close to the experiments, make us less sensitive to uh, fluctuations from the monochromator. Uh, this will be where the microprobe stations will be. So we'll have a regular microprobe and potentially this SEE maybe will be here. And then the second two hutches are for the other branch. Um, we have multiple stations again, the Lyric spectrometer, advanced spectroscopy station, and then hutches are stations in here for experiments that maybe take a longer setup time so we can run in, run in this station while we're setting up complicated experiments here. And one of the stations would probably be more or less dedicated for the laser pump probe. We also have a control area here for the, a large laser that'll be permanently mounted. There's a smaller laser that'll be in the hutch. And then there's a more portable laser um, that'll be housed in this station and, and brought, brought into the hutch when, when needed but they also wanted to be able to operate this laser offline. So we have a separate uh, control area for that. Uh, just one other thing to mention, I guess, is with our mirrors, we get about a 30 centimeter separation of the beams at this micropro station. So that, that should be adequate for most applications. So now I'd like to just go in a little bit more detail of things that I find interesting, at least. 
about our, our optics and our our setup. So the mirrors are are high heat load mirrors, so they need to be cooled. They're going to be cooled by the slot cooling method, where we have the interface between the mirror and the cooled copper uh, blocks through a liquid gallium indium gallium eutectic. So there's no direct clamping to the mirrors. So that makes them free to be uh, bendable. As I mentioned, they have three slots, slots for uh, stripes for harmonic rejection. Uh, one thing I found interesting was this idea of using uh, cutouts on the side of the mirror to reduce the thermal bump. Uh, this was demonstrated nicely in a paper here by at uh, ESRF people. So the cooling is at the, near the surface at these pads. But if you put a sl relief slot in, you can reduce the thermal bending dramatically. And in fact, at one particular, uh, at, for a particular heat load, you can basically eliminate the thermal bending. Now, in our case, we have a varying heat load. But even just taking a, an average sort of slot, we can reduce our thermal bump by as much as five times. So we can get the thermal bump down to less than 0.2 milliradians. Uh, and this shows the R slot design. It's just this tiny little cutout, uh, which is designed with a particular depth to optimize the, the cooling. Uh, the monochrometer, the main interest of the monochrometer is the fact that we're able, because we have a small offset, to have multi layers in the same monochrometer as the crystals. So if you, this shows the layout of, of the crystals. So these two inner blocks are the silicon crystals, and then these outer blocks are the multilayers. So if we want the beam to hit the multilayer, we just move to a small angle, and we move the monochrometer up by about one millimeter vertical. That moves the intersection point to the um, multilayer rather than the, the first crystal. So the multilayers themselves are, are being made at the APS. This shows us the first batch of, of multilayers. We're using molybdenum boron carbide. We chose that because we tested a, a test multilayer uh, at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, there's not a lot of experience using uh, multilayers at liquid nitrogen, so we wanted to make sure that ours were going to work. And we were able to do 10 cycles at, to liquid nitrogen and back and saw very little change in the reflectivity. And this just shows the calculated reflectivity based on measurements on these multilayers. In other words, based on the roughness and the, and the interface sharpness of the measured interface sharpness of the multilayers. You can see that we get a bandwidth of about 3%, but we still have a reflectivity that's quite high of the order of 80% uh, or so. So just to sort of conclude with talking about the zoom capabilities for our KB mirrors, um, for most environmental samples, it's, it's the case where you're looking for some of the things that are often fairly rare. Uh, you're searching around for a particular element or a particular hot spot of, of pollutants, say. So usually people want to scan a very large area. And, and even with quick scanning techniques where we just do uh, 10 or 50 milliseconds a point, it can take a long time if you're at a micron or submicron resolution to cover a, a very large area. So then people would typically uh, spread out their scan lines, something like this. But of course, then you risk missing something. So what we'd like to do is be able to expand the beam and then contract the beam quickly without moving the beam on the sample so that you can go back to this to the spot that you found in, with the wide area beam. There are several ways of doing that, but the, probably the most popular has been to use an intermediate focal point where we focus the beam and then use a slit to contour, control the, the source size for the KB mirrors. The problem with that is you're only going to get the full beam, the full intensities when the slit is open. If, then if to make the smaller beam, you have to close the slit and you lose some flux. Well, at the NBA lattice, we are able to focus the entire beam already down to the spot size is similar to what we need, like of order one micron. So that intermediate focus would be 
sacrificing flux when we're using the smallest beams. So what we've been testing and what seems to work pretty well is using a, a, a brilliant lens or, to uh, change the effective source size. So if we put the lens in the beam, it's just slightly focusing. We, if we extend the beam back to the source where we're using this source as the input for the KV mirrors, we can see that if we change the strength of the focusing here, we change the apparent source size that the, that the mirrors are seeing. Now the mirrors are actually in, in right after the, positioned right after these lenses. So the focus of the lens is not the focus that we're using. We're just using the lens to modify the source size. And this seemed to work quite well. Uh, the blue curves here show the uh, beam size uh, without the lens. Um, it's about one micron in this, these cases. And then when we put the lens, we actually use two cylindrical lenses, put the lens in, we can easily increase the beam size up to order 10 microns. And you notice these knife edge scans, uh, the beam's position is not changing. So by, and it's easy to put these lenses, if you have a high precision stage, put these lenses in and out in just a matter of seconds. So we think this will be a nice way to uh, set up the beam line so we can have a, a variable uh, microprobe uh, resolution uh, that can be easily changed without moving the beam on the sample. So just to conclude, then our current status is all the major components that uh, belong to the beam line are either ordered or in hand. The Hutch construction was started, the FOE is completed, but of course now we're on hold for, uh, because of uh, stay at home orders, but we'll hopefully we'll be able to start that in sometime in the near future. The monochrometers and mirrors are completed. They passed the factory acceptance tests and are in the process of getting shipped. They're due to be here in May. All the other smaller components are here, uh, more or less. Um, so depending on when we can uh, restart our work, I think it's still possible that we can get first beam in late 2020. Uh, our plan had been to test one of the monochrometers at sector 28, which is also being a newly constructed beam line, somewhat before our sector was ready, but I'm not sure that's going to be uh, doable nowadays. But in any case, we expect to be running next year for sure, and we'll be running then with the uh, initial running will be with the current uh, APS ring. The accelerator up upgrade is then planned to have a one-year shutdown starting sometime in 2022. Uh, it was originally for mid-2022. We'll have to see if that schedule is going to change. So just to summarize, we plan to move our current productive stations to a candid undulator sec sector. This will allow us to enhance some of the current 20 ID programs, for example, by using a multi-layer monochrometer, and it'll be a new home for spectroscopy. So that's my talk and thank you for listening.